Uh, so tonight we are in Psalm 25, and the title of the message, If Not God, Then Who? And I remember early on, I became a believer at 18, and so it was after high school, but you know, the Lord made me just to be real analytical, and I remember thinking about life and things, and I was kind of a happy, happy 18-year-old. I didn't have no issues or anything, and um, no insecurities, raised in a very good home and the whole, the whole bit, but I just remember thinking about life, and even at 18, thinking like, wait a minute, where's all this headed? Can you imagine thinking that at 18? And then my grandfather, who was visiting from New York in, in his broken English, and he was 80 years old or something, he stood in front of me and he says, Antonio, Antonio, when he knew he had my attention, he just started, he says, look at me. And he just began to turn really slow in front of me, and I'm like mm -hmm. looking at him. And he did a rotation, and when he got back to looking at me, he says, that was my life. That was it. And, uh, and so... So if not God, then who? It's like, where do you go? And, and these psalms are, are amazing. You know, as I was reading through this psalm, I was thinking, as life happens and life unfolds, it's unfolding all around us, some things are planned, some things that happened are unplanned, some expected, you know, some expected, you know, like the status quo. There's certain things that are going to happen in life, and certain things are usual, and they're typical, and they work, they work out. But yet sometimes things are unexpected. Things happen that are, you know, cannot be planned. And uh, things can get crazy sometimes in life. And, and that, but that is life. You know, it, it's the way it goes. And I thought of when Jesus asked his disciples the question, because many had left him, he began to say hard things. John chapter 6. I think you're going into John chapter 6 next. And uh, Jesus began to say the hard things. And when he said these things, many stopped following him. And, and then so Jesus asked his disciples the question, do you also want to go away? And Peter, in his classic way, answers and he said in john chapter 6 but simon peter answered him lord to whom shall we go you have the words of eternal life also we have come to believe and know that you are the christ the son of the living god and so you have the words of eternal life you know except you know except it be the lord where do we, do we go for that kind of hope and those kind of that kind of confidence and so hard things happen jesus would say to us during the difficult times whether they be physical or emotional or relational or financial whether they're understood or misunderstood whatever the scenario is and he would ask do you want to go away too because we're challenged in our faith and in our trust and in our confidence. Is the Lord, are we following the Lord or aren't we? What would be our response? And what comes to mind, if not God, then who? And that's what I think all the time. I think, where would I go? Who would I talk to? Where could I go? And then we learn in this psalm that David, he knew that very well, that he had to go to God and the different uh, things that happened in his life, and, and they were crazy things and unexpected things. But God, he knew, was there. He knew that God was there. And it was God's counsel that he sought, and... It was God's word that he looked to. And this is what I had in mind when I was reading through this. And, just the, and also in the meaning of the title, if not God, then who? 
if we did not have God to turn to, then where could we possibly go? Think of one place. Because when you think about eternity, that's a God word. And um, there's nowhere else to go. But we do have God to turn to. And that's the blessing. And so in Psalm, this Psalm written by David. Now David was uh, interesting because the Bible says David was a man after God's own heart. And yet we know that David, you know, he rose to great heights. But also we know of David that he fell to great depths. And we know that God never kicked him to the curb. That didn't mean that there wasn't serious consequences to David's sin. But my thought was is that God is working with each of us who have risen to great heights and fallen. Maybe not to as great as heights. Maybe not as to as depths of low, low of depths as David. But each of us have, we're all the same. And I only think this way, when you think about yourself, do you think, wow, God really has a winner with me, you know? Or do you think like, uh, no, I'm a loser too. And somehow, by God's grace, he uses me. And so I'm encouraged because when I see the testimonies of all the men of faith and women of faith in the Bible, I realize that they're no different. They're no different, and that's the way God has recorded the word for us so that we're encouraged by Scripture. And so we are to do our best and then commit the rest to the Lord because we will fail in our attempts. In verse 1, David, praying, he said, To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. And so David... He is seeking the Lord first and foremost. In this psalm, he seeks the Lord. And I think uh, not seeking last resort, um, although that's exactly what we're, we're prone to do. You know, after I'm desperate, I seek the Lord. And when, when there are no other options, I seek the Lord. Or when things are just so bad and everything's gone wrong, I seek the Lord. And, you know, who knows David's state at this time? I know that there was times like us not initially seeking the Lord. As a matter of fact, you know, uh, resisting uh, the Lord and God's word. But he's seeking the Lord and he says, he says, oh, Lord, I lift up my soul. And so he's lifting up his soul. He's realizing he can't do this and uh, that whatever it is that he's going through in this time, nobody can say for sure, but he's in a way that he knows he has to go to the Lord. And so he says, and I lift up my soul, my, my innermost being, he's lifting up to the Lord. So it's just not a surface sort of going through the motions kind of a prayer, but he's seeking the Lord. He's, he's asking the Lord to meet him in that place. And, and, um, and so he's seriously seeking the Lord. I think it'd be the difference is if, you know, you were looking for your favorite coffee cup and you were, you know, diligently trying to find it because it's so important to you, maybe endearing to you, or you're looking for your missing child. How would they compare? And so we have to be, be careful. We're seeking the Lord, and what's, what's our, you know, our motivation? Are we truly seeking the Lord, or is it just sort of like going through the motions? Are we desperately seeking for the Lord's answer? He says in verse 2, Oh, my God, I trust in you. Let me not be ashamed. Let not my enemies triumph over me. And so he's confident, he's saying, in the Lord. You know, God will, we know, never leave us or forsake us. Are we confident of that? If we are, then we can seek the Lord and trust the Lord. And what he does or he does not do or what he allows or he doesn't allow, 
we can trust the Lord and, um, you know, for what he has for us. And uh, he says, uh, so that let me not be ashamed. You know, when, when I read that, I thought about the Apostle Paul and how we had gone over um, in uh, Timothy and how we looked at, at Paul trying to encourage Timothy and not being ashamed of his sufferings and all that he was going through. Because in doing so, then you'd be doubting that it was the Lord who was using Paul and um, allowing what he was allowing. And Paul was saying, you know, <laughs> making it clear that his trusting in the Lord wasn't circumstantial, it wasn't situational. It was just plain out trusting in the Lord. He said to Timothy in the second letter, just before Paul's about to be taken out, taken out of here, he says in 2 Timothy 1.8, Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of the Lord, nor of me, his prisoner. You know, that was him, a prisoner. But share with me in the sufferings for the gospel according to the power of God. And so why should we even entertain the idea of suffering? Paul says, because of the gospel. And what is the gospel? The gospel, he says in another place, it is the power of God unto salvation. <clears throat> so why should you even entertain going through hard things for the name of Christ? Because of the gospel. Because in other words, people are going to get saved. And that's what Paul's saying. And that's the reason for it. There's a reason why we would entertain such a thing. We're not just certainly supposed to be gluttons for punishment. You know, there's reasons why we're willing to go through something and be sacrificial in our lives and not be ashamed. And we should not be ashamed at one another. You know, some of us have to go through harder things than others. And, and we have to look at this as, you know, a spiritual battle. And there's reasons for it. And people are coming to faith for our, the suffering of our life and things that we go through. And so, indeed, he says in verse 3, let, not, <clears throat> let no one who waits on you, be ashamed. Let those be ashamed who deal treacherously without cause. And so he's making the difference, the contrast. You know, those who would wait upon the Lord. And you're waiting for the supernatural intervention of the Lord and not to be ashamed at the timing of God. Because oftentimes it's like, when, Lord, when? And then others would say, see, is God really real in your life? You're trusting God, but has he done what you prayed that he would do and you're trusting him to do? You know, or, or let us not be ashamed. But the Bible tells us that, you know, there are benefits to waiting on the Lord. In Isaiah 30, 18, therefore, the Lord will wait. This is the Lord waiting that he may be great, <clears throat> gracious to you. And therefore... And therefore he will be exalted that he may have mercy on you. For the Lord is a God of justice. Blessed are all those who wait for him. And so, again, we're waiting, knowing God is waiting for the right time to do whatever it is so for, to bless us. And that's the dynamics that I've always had problems with, is not so much what God's will might be, but the timing of God's will. And I remember when uh, I went into the interview to get into the pastor, pastoral school, um, it was interesting because I was supposed to go and interview with Raul Reese and his board to get into this uh, exclusive pastoral school where they were going to only accept 30 pastors. And so when I went to go on in the interview, Alandrina went, with me and so she's standing there and well come on in you know who's this so oh, this is my wife Alandrina well bring her in too so she ended up in the interview with me and one of the questions that they asked me early on was so what is what is the greatest thing that you're struggling with right now in your life and I thought about it and I go you know the will of the Lord like what is his will and um and it was um, mainly for a timing issue is 
what I boiled it down to. And, and uh, they all laughed at me when I said that. It's like, yeah, well, that's not going to ever end. You're always going to be wondering, okay, Lord, what do I do today? What's your will for me today? I don't know what to, to do. Lord, how, how, can I, how do I serve you? And so if you're comfortable with that, then you'll be one that will, you know, chill out while you're waiting for the Lord. In Isaiah 40, verse 31, But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. And so shall renew their strength. And so basically when we wait in confidence on the Lord, it recharges us. It doesn't wear us out, is the idea. I'm waiting on the Lord. Why are you just so patiently waiting on the Lord? Because that's what I'm supposed to do. And then it says there, you know, you mount up with wings like eagles. So you're soaring with a great perspective. You know, you can see far, you can see wide, you can see close. And you're above looking, you know, you're in a good, pers- you have a good perspective. You're not chattering with the sparrows on the ground. You know, you see ch- sparrows, right? Chattering, fighting, rolling around, getting all dusty. <laughs> no, you're, you're with the eagles looking down. And so, and so, you know, what a blessing. But let, let them be ashamed who deal treacherously without cause. So those aren't going to be the believers and I think that we have a working example of uh, this happening right now in politics, this following, following the election. You know, many of us already were aware, up to speed with what was going on uh, with the false reports and fake news and all of that. Um, um, but now, afterwards, now all the lying is being brought to the forefront and we're going, yeah, well, we've seen it all along. But what's interesting, what you don't see, and uh, you don't hear any that are ashamed of it. You know, let them be ashamed. And you don't, you know, I would say don't hold your breath. They're not going to be ashamed of it. They're going to make excuses after excuses uh, and change things only as it would require their, how they would make their, their money and keep their, their news, uh, you know, <clears throat> their news uh, source open. But that would be the only reason. They're not ashamed of it. They'll do it again just as soon as they can. But in verse 4, show me your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. And so this is a good way to study the Bible. As you study the Bible, Lord, show me, you know, show me, uh, Show me your word. You know, show me your ways. And because it is God's counsel, God's word is God's counsel. The Bible tells us, you know, the word is a lamp to our feet and the light to our path. I've always loved that. And so we study the word. It illuminates like a lamp your immediate area that you're dealing with. But it also shines a bright light like a floodlight down where you're headed, which is eventually to heaven. And so you're clear in, by taking in God's counsel, his way and his paths. Now, those two words in the Hebrew have similar meanings. It's the idea of <clears throat> that you're asking the Lord to guide you, you know, to be your personal guide. And guide me, Lord. You're asking God, you know, to do that, to lead you. And then eventually, of course, that's all the way into eternity. Lead me in your truth and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. On you I wait all the day. You know, the Bible tells us to meditate day and night when it comes to the word. And the Bible tells us to pray without ceasing. And so all the day long, we're to be communicating with the Lord. And talking to the Lord. And that's what David is saying there. Hey, I wait all, all the day waiting on you and um, anticipating what the Lord would do. Remember, O Lord, your tender mercies and your loving kindness, for they are f- from of old. 
And so David is recalling the Lord's faithfulness in his life, his loving kindness that he's experienced. He appeals to God's unchanging nature. And so he's able to pray that with insight. Lord, I know what your word says about you. I know, Lord, that you're merciful. I know, Lord, that you're gracious. I know, Lord, that you're patient. And he's calling upon the Lord who changes not. And I think that that's great to be able to pray with that kind of insight, knowing the nature of the Lord. Do not remember the sins of my youth, nor my transgressions according to your mercy. Remember me for your goodness sake. Oh, Lord. And so the sins of your youth, um, I would say that that would include B.C., before you were a Christian. I call it before Christ, your B.C. days. But it, it also could be your youth after you became a Christian, uh, when you were young and dumb, and you did dumb things and um, the sins of, of your youth when maybe you didn't really know better. And um, when you would even say, looking back, I can't believe I did something so that stupid, you know, <laughs> when, when you used to not pray about it because you were afraid the Lord was going to say no. <laughs> and that's not the answer that you wanted to hear. So you purposely didn't pray. Or you did pray and did hear no, but no, that must not have been me because I know that this is a good thing. You know, things like that when you were young and dumb. And, uh, and yet, knowing, the Bible tells us, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. And so to, knowing that we can, move, we can move forward from that, the sins of our youth and our past, that things have become new, and it's according to your mercy, uh, remember me. In other words, Lord, not in my transgressions and my sin, but in your mercy and in your goodness. And so that's huge to acknowledge um, because that is what the Lord does. He does remember us in that way. And the Bible tells us that there is no more that condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. Um, in Romans 8.1, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. And so obedience, you know, is determined you know, the things that the Lord is doing with us. You know, we're, we're obeying. But it says there that there's, there's no condemnation. How's that possible? How, how's that possible that there's no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus? Well, because he took the condemnation upon himself. We're no longer condemned. It doesn't mean that you're no longer going to be a sinner, but it means that there's no more condemnation because you're following the Lord who delivered you from that condemnation. And so, and so that's how that's possible because of what the Lord has done and is doing in your life. The condemnation is no more. You're no longer condemned, held guilty, the penalty of sin. So then we look at verse 8. Good and upright is the Lord. Therefore, he teaches sinners in the way. And so the Lord didn't come, you know, to save the, what's that scripture? Uh, he didn't come for the healthy, but for the sick, you know. And basically what we learn is, is that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. He came for sinners. There's nobody that would be exempt from that. And so he came for that. And he desires to bless us. <clears throat> the Bible, you know, tells us, uh, Jesus says, fear not, little flock. It is the Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. And that's the heart of God. Fear not, little flock. You know, little scared little sheep. It's your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. 
And so we're encouraged by Jesus in his heart. And so, but he teaches, uh, he teaches us. And, uh, and, and he who would say that he's without sin, the Bible says, is deceived. Because there's nobody without sin. And so he's come for the sinner. He came for us. The humble, he guides in justice. And the humble, he teaches his way. And so, you know, throughout scripture, we learn the importance of humility. Because the Bible, you know, makes that very clear. How important humility is. And we know that God resists uh, otherwise in James 4, 6. But he gives more grace. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. And so what would that even mean that God resists the proud? It would mean that, um, you know, the blessings that God would like to bless you with uh, are hindered. You know, the things in your life God causes to go south because of your pride rather than being humble. You know, the Bible tells us uh, not to quench the spirit, quench not the spirit. And so we would be quenching the spirit if we're pr prideful. But it says here that, you know, the, to the humble, he teaches his way. And so the benefits uh, abound. And I know that, um, you know, people will uh, boast in this world Oh, I'm, I have a degree from Harvard, Harvard, or I have a degree from Yale, you know, or wherever that they have their degree from. But we boast in the Lord. I have a disciple's degree, you know, because the Lord himself has taught me. And, um, you know, we have uh, a degree of grace, you know, from the University of Grace, we have a degree. And how much more valuable is that? I know uh, the first time I taught through the entire Bible, I felt like I had earned a, a doctorate. <laughs> and you know what? That, what I learned teaching through the entire Bible from Genesis all the way through the end of Revelation is worth way more than any degree that you could get through any of the universities that people boast about. Because God, being my teacher my professor, you know, teaching me through is incredible what he has taught me. And so the humble, he teaches his way. And, um, and so we need to keep ourselves in that place of humility so that the Lord, you would learn the Lord's way. All the paths of the Lord are mercy and truth to such as keep his covenant and his testimonies. When it speaks of his testimonies, it's speaking of the witness of the law or the word is the testimony of the Lord and that it would keep his covenant. And so those of us, there's a contingency of blessing. We keep those things that the Lord blesses us with and teaches us. You know, the, the paths of the Lord are mercy and truth. Mercy, it means loving kindness and favor and, and pity. Truth is what's right and um you know just um you know giving us making us giving us assurance and so that's the truth that comes as we learn from the lord for your and it says in verse um, 11 for your namesake O lord pardon my iniquity for it is great and so we're not sure when david wrote this psalm but it's very possible that he wrote this psalm after his sin of murder and adultery. And, uh, and so with true conviction, he, he's praying, you know, for your name's sake. And so, Lord, you have a reputation. He's saying, when you say, you know, your name's sake, you have a reputation. Lord, of, of a God who's gracious and a God who's forgiving to those who call upon you. He also has a reputation of a God of judgment. 
and a God of holiness and a God that will deal with sin. But if you remember Moses, he knew the heart of God and he cried out to the Lord and prayed to intervene for the people when the people sinned out uh, in the wilderness. And, And it says in Exodus 32, then Moses pleaded with the Lord, his God, and said, Lord, why does your wrath burn hot against your people whom you have brought out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? Why should the Egyptians speak and say he brought them out to harm them, to kill them in the mountains, and to consume them from the face of the earth? Turn from your fierce wrath and relent from, his, from this harm to your people. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, your servants to whom you swore by your own self, And said to them, I will multiply your descendants as the stars of heaven. And all this land that I have spoken of, I give to your descendants. And they shall inherit it forever. And so did Moses not know the heart of the Lord? He did. And so he intervened. And that's that's the heart that we need to know. That's the heart that David is portraying that he knew. And the heart that he's appealing to. And in the name and reputation of God Almighty. You know, he's crying out to the Lord. Knowing who it is that he's crying out to. And I'd only say that the world is watching. The Egyptians are watching. And so, and so they're, you know, watching how we interact with the Lord. And receive that goodness and mercy and grace of the lord i remember um i remember when we left um california there was a friend that i painted with that i was always ministering to and you know he really he really wasn't open um you know and i remember um a lot of conversations when you work with somebody a lot of conversations and so uh, i remember it was interesting he was really a smart guy um, he was a Beatle fan, and he knew every Beatles song ever sung by heart. So he was brilliant, you know, thinker, to be able to do that. And it's sad that he wouldn't know every scripture, that much scripture by heart. And, um, and I just remember that talking to him about going to Oregon and trusting the Lord and not having anything, and he says, oh, you'll be back. And I say, he says, I know so many people who have gone and they, they lost everything that they had, all the money they saved, and they had to come back to California to where they can get a good job and everything. And I said, well, that's not an issue with me because I have no money to lose. I'm going up there, and if God doesn't provide, I'm, I have nothing. <clears throat> and I told him, I said, But I really believe in my heart that the Lord is calling us up to Oregon to plant a church. And so knowing the Lord, where God guides, he provides. And if I'm hearing right, I won't be back. And sure enough, we were never back. Because God did amazing things to to call us here. And so... I was hoping, along with some follow-up conversations and his own son who became a Christian and spoke into his life, and then he died. And I was hoping that he died knowing Jesus, just from testimonies like that, you know, because it was a God thing. He couldn't ignore that. And so for, you, for your namesake, O oh Lord, pardon my iniquity, for it is great. And so... He's saying, my sin is very, very great. You remember when we were looking at Paul when he says, I'm the chief of sinners. There was something about Paul he realized 14 years later, after acknowledging that he's a sinner, that 14 years later, walking with the Lord, serving the Lord, using mighty body, he's, I'm the chief of sinners. It wasn't that his sin became any greater, but his perspective became clearer. And he understood how far his sin really would separate him from God. And the nature of his, his old nature. And so, 
And so he uh, said, I was chief of sinner, and he acknowledged that he was least among the apostles. And in humility, he said, for I am least of the apostles who am not worthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. He recognized his sin, and they had no reason to be ever to ever think that he would be called to such a position. He says, but by the grace of God, I am what I am, and, and his grace toward me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all, and yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. And so even by the work I was able to do was because of God's grace, it wasn't me, but yet he was a brilliant scholar and he had a pedigree that was an arm long, an arm, you know, arm's length of things he could have boasted for, but he said, hey, I count all that as dung. Uh, that's behind me. None of that even matters. What matters is that I know the Lord and, and his grace. And so Paul acknowledged that, and that's the humility that God was able to use in his life. And, and you know, David is acknowledging that his sin was great, and I'd only say that any sin that separates you from the living God is a great sin. And, you know, who is the man that fears the Lord? Him shall he teach in the way he chooses. And so it's a godly reverence that the Lord would teach us. And it doesn't get better than that, that God would promise to be your private tutor. The Holy Spirit would teach you and be your private tutor. And I call that quality education, you know, that would teach you to navigate life, this, this world. And to make decisions, that's the idea. To make the right decisions, to, to, to lead you in the way. It speaks of direction. Um, everybody knows what a compass is. Everybody could say, I know how a compass works. You hold it up and it shows you which way is north. Well, there's a whole lot more to encompass than that. That's why there's 360 degrees. That's why they're, uh, they're taught in the military how to use a compass and a map and how to, to you know, line up an, uh, uh, where they're going. And they can pinpoint where they're at if they have the map and a compass when they're in the wilderness. I have a general idea of it, but I can't do that. I was never trained. And then you want to make it harder? Uh, they have what they call a, a, a sex, sexton, a sexton or se, whatever. Sexton. sexton. They have a sexton. And they use that to navigate out in the sea using the stars. And however that works, the instruments that, that men have come up with, to give them direction so they don't get lost out in the middle of the ocean. Now, you put me on a boat in the middle of the ocean with a sexton and all the star maps and everything that I need, and guess what? I'd be lost, totally lost. Now, you teach me how to use all that and put me in the middle of the ocean, and I'm not lost. Why? Because I know how to use all of that stuff. And that's what happens when God teaches you the word. You're not going to be lost anymore. In the worst situations and storms of life, you're going to know exactly how to navigate the situation because you've been taught by God. And that's the difference. You know, and he says that, that he shall teach in the way he chooses. God him, he himself shall dwell in prosperity. And so, and his descendants shall inherit the earth. The blessing that keeps on giving. I thought, wow, what a blessing to live life knowing that my descendants are going to be blessed. As the Lord tarries so far, you know, and if he continues, my descendants are going to be blessed. That's a promise of the Lord. And he says that he shall dwell in prosperity. In the King James, it says ease. You know, when you think prosperity right away, you think wealth and monetary items and so forth. That's not what the word's speaking of. It could include that, but what it means is you're encircled in blessing. That's the prosperity. It speaks of good. It speaks of pleasure. It speaks of those things agreeable. And so here you are living life, 
surrounded by the blessings of the Lord. Now, you may be poorer than dirt, but you're surrounded by the blessings of the Lord. And I say that seriously because if you're a third world, live in a third world country in some jungle somewhere and you're a believer, you're surrounded by dirt, but the immeasurable blessings of the Lord. You're living in prosperity, you know, as the Lord would begin to direct him. The secret of the Lord is with those who fear him, and he will show them his covenant. And so the secret of God's counsel is familiar to us. It's made known to us and not to others. To others who don't know, to them, they don't know. But to us, we do know. That's the secret of the Lord, is with those who fear him, and he will show them his covenant. And so if you if you fast forward from when this was written, the covenant of the Lord was the old covenant, and it's the, the new covenant. And so he blesses us with his word. And, and the word covenant, it means alliance. It means a pledge as if as in a friendship. That's the covenant, the promises of the Lord, you know, to us. And Proverbs 17, 17, a friend loves at all time and a brother is born for adversity at all times, even hard times. That's, that's the idea of a covenant. In John 15, 13, greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. That's the new covenant that Jesus did that for us. And that's, the, that's what's meant by a covenant. He says, my eyes are ever toward the Lord, for he shall pluck my feet out of the net. Speaks of deliverance from a trap that is set. And so, and that's a big deal in warfare, that you'd be able to avoid the traps that are set, whether it be an ambush, a booby trap, a, a landmine, whatever, to have the insight to avoid those. In the spiritual battle, God does that. You know, you might say God runs, walks point, and he alerts you. Okay, only got a couple minutes here. Turn yourself to me and have mercy on me, for I am desolate and afflicted. Feeling lonely, feeling isolated, feel alone, feel poor, for needy. The troubles of my heart have enlarged. Bring me out of my distresses. Lord, things are getting worse. They're not shrinking. They're getting bigger is the idea. Things are going in the wrong direction. Bring me out of my distresses. And so this is the feeling that, 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 that accompanies that. Look on my affliction and my pain, which means misery, sorrow, labor, weariness. You know, just things that toil, it also means trouble. Uh, consider my enemies, for they are many, and they hate me with cruel hatred. In other words, unjust, wrong, violent. Of course, that's what enemies are all about. Keep my soul and deliver me. Let, let me not be ashamed. And so the word means don't let me be confused or confounded or disconcerted or disapproved, you know, or dis, dis, disappointed. And uh, that's the idea there, to be, not be ashamed. Deliver me, rescue me, save me. You know, snatch, snatch me from the enemy's grip. Um, I put my trust in you. So in the midst of all that, I trust in you. You're my refuge. Uh, let integrity and uprightness preserve me. And um, for I wait for you. And um, so it means eagerly and expectantly. Lord, preserve me, guard me from danger. Keep watch over me. Redeem Israel, O God, out of all their troubles. And I would only say that that's, you know, some prayers, you know, never get old. <laughs> and that's one of them. You know, the Bible says that we're to pray for the peace of Israel. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May they prosper who love you. And that's a promise. And so we support Israel, God's people. And then the last thing is that the Lord blesses those who bless them. In Genesis 12, 1 through 3, Now the Lord had said to Abraham, Get out of your country, from your family, and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. 
I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. And so, rescue Israel, Lord, from their troubles, because their troubles are many. Israel has lots of troubles. And this is um, current day, but the thing is, it's always been that way with Israel. And they're on the front page of all the newspapers, all the front line, the headlines of Israel and all of their troubles. But the Lord chose to put our nation in, going to put our nation in a place of strength. And our nation will always stand with Israel until it's time for, I believe, the rapture of the church. And then this nation will become globally absorbed and all hell will break loose. But, um, but until then, keep praying and pray for our administration and all that's going on. It's exciting. It's exciting what God has in store. Aren't we looking for another, another revival before we're raptured out of here? Why not? Amen. Lord, uh, thank you again for your word and just how you encourage us. We ask for your blessing upon us, Lord. We thank you that you keep us in a place of prosperity who trust you. We want to thank you that we're surrounded by your blessings and we're surrounded by your spirit, Lord. We ask that you fill us to overflowing. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you.